All right, <clears throat> so it was a beautiful rest of the class. It was wonderful. I ran out of space on my phone midway through. So we're gonna try and pick it up here. And <clears throat> if you're complaining, I get, to, I get to give a quiz twice. Yay. Um, part of my job as saying you're not repentant is what in the church we end up calling excommunication. Um, ex meaning out, away from, and then communication meaning from communion. And if you are an adult, the way you normally participate in the life of the congregation is via participating in the Lord's Supper. Now, obviously, we're not doing that because we're not having our normal gathering. But, well, we'll talk more about the Lord's Supper in the weeks to come, too. But there, there does come a point when if someone is so far off the pale, so far removed from God's word, so far caught up in fear or, or loving or trusting things other than God that, that they're just neck deep in sin, there are times I tell them, no, you, you, should, you can't commune now. You need to repent. This is part of the reason why we generally have uh, confession, and absolution, confession and absolution in the service before we celebrate the Lord's Supper. Now, normally at first, if I, if I tell someone this, the, job, the, the hope is that they'll snap out of it and repent. If they keep on going, the congregation as a whole might say, okay, no, we're going to remove you from, from our membership roles because you're just off the reservation. You're off the deep end. But even when that's done, the goal of this isn't to punish. The goal is to discipline. In fact, this is often called church discipline. And, and if you are disciplining someone, it's not so much to punish them, but it's to correct them, to, to get their behaviors online. And, and if someone doesn't think that what they're doing and it's wrong is serious, oh, pastor, just make... If I say, no, you can't come to communion, that should be the sign that, no, no, we're serious. You are really going against God's word here. And the hope is that they will repent. And once they repent, then there's forgiveness, then they're back up, then they're welcome back into communion. This is one of the things sometimes I have to do. Now, it, <clears throat> it's a rare thing. I think I've had to tell people maybe three times that I can commune them. And I don't think I've ever had to have someone removed from the congregation. Now, what does happen is often people will excommunicate themselves. They will stop coming if they know they're doing something wrong. Because they don't want to hear me say that they're doing something wrong. Or they'll leave the church on their own. Um, that happens somewhat often. The problem is with this, one of the things we need to remember as people is that we can often be wrong. And we need other people. We need good friends, good neighbors, parents, good pastors, to let us know when we're going off the deep end. Um, one of my, my best friend in college was a fellow by the name of Tony. And uh, one of the things that I appreciate about him is that we were both very secure in our friendship. We both knew each other well and trusted each other. And we were close enough to be honest with each other. If I was doing something stupid, if I was being a, a great A jerk, Tony would pull me aside and say, Eric, you're being a great A jerk. And, and if Tony was doing something foolish, I'd be able to pull him aside and say, you, you shouldn't do this. And we listened to each other. We, we valued that, that clear and loving advice. And so even if I do have to tell someone that they're sinning, that's done out of love. This, this isn't done because I'm mad and want to get them. 
No, it, it's, it's a matter of I, I love you. And you're going down a bad path and you need to stop. Otherwise, it's going to have really bad consequences for you. And that's part of my job. And, and it's not necessarily a fun part of the job. No one likes to do that. But it's one of the things that you, you get to do. Um, I don't go hunt you down. I don't, I don't try to go over your life with a fine-tooth comb. But if something becomes a big public hubbubaloo, I might end up talking to you about it because that's what that's part of what goes on. But the goal, the priority, what what we want to have is living this forgiveness, living as people who confess their sin, fight against it, and then receive God's word of forgiveness. Being people who who hear that word of forgiveness and gladly go and forgive the other people that God has placed into our lives. So. Um, I think that's what I've got. I think that's where I'm going to lecture for the moment. Um, since you are at home and we can't do the normal back and forth, um, we're going to uh, take, a, take a quiz. And uh, it's going to have two parts. The first part will be true or false. So I don't know if this is going to show up very well. But let's start. If you have pen and paper ready, we'll go over this. So... <clears throat> Question one, true or false? Confession has two parts. We confess our sin and receive forgiveness. I'll repeat that again. Confession has two parts. We confess our sin and receive forgiveness. Question two, if we don't know that we've done something wrong, it's not really a sin. True or false? If we don't know that we've done something wrong, it's not really a sin. Question three, we have to do something good to make up for our sin. True or false? We have to do something good to make up for our sin. Four, when the pastor says that we are forgiven, he is speaking God's word. True or false? When the pastor says that we are forgiven, he is speaking God's word. Question five, when we confess a specific sin to our pastor, he is to never talk about it. True or false? When we confess a specific sin to our pastor, he is never to talk about it. True or false? Question six. If a person refuses to repent of a sin, the pastor is supposed to tell them that they are not forgiven. True or false? If a person refuses to repent of a sin, the pastor is supposed to tell them that they are not forgiven. Question seven. The office of the keys refers to the person who unlocks the church door. True or false? The office of the keys refers to the person who unlocks the church doors. Question eight. Any man has the right to be a pastor if he wants to be. True or false? Any man has the right to be a pastor if he wants to be. Question nine. Excommunication is when a person is kicked out of church because they are a bad person. True or false? Excommunication is when a person is kicked out of the church because they are a bad person. And question 10. If a person has been excommunicated, they can never be in the church again. If a person has been excommunicated, they can never be in the church again. Let's go over those. Um, <clears throat> question 1. Confession has two parts. We confess our sins and receive forgiveness. Okay, that, that's basically almost literally the catechism answer. Do your reading. I, especially now, you need to do the assigned reading simply because, well, I don't get to see you guys face to face. So, two, true or false? If we don't know that we've done something wrong, it's not really a sin. That is false. Um, just because we don't know that something we've done is wrong, it's still a sin. In fact, many of the times when we sin, we aren't even aware of it. We, we do things in passing and mess up and move on beyond it. And we don't even think about what we've done. That's why we confess all of all our sins, even the ones we don't know. Uh, if you're not sure of this whole idea of if, if you don't know it's a sin, it's not a sin, uh, let me put it this way. Let's say that I go and I do something that upsets my wife and I don't even notice about it and I, I really hurt her. I, I can do that without even noticing, noticing it. 
it still hurts her. It's still a sin. It's still something that was wrong. It's not wrong because I know it's wrong. It's wrong because it is wrong. And that's the point. And so we are cut constantly called to forget, confess our sins, even the ones we don't know. All right, question three. We have to do something good to make up for our sin. That is false. Christ Jesus did everything that we need to do, everything that needs to be done to make up for our sin. That's why he declared on the cross, it is finished. It's done. Now, some of you might say, well, well what about <clears throat> when I sin against my neighbor? What, what if I do something mean? What if I, not that any of you are picking on your brothers or sisters, but what if I were to do something mean to my, my, my sibling? Shouldn't I do something to make it up? Well, yeah, you, you probably should, but it's not something that you have to do. Um, I'm going I'm to use the example of my wife and I. Let's say again, I uh, did something to my wife and didn't even realize what I was doing and hurt her. I, I should try to uh, make that up to her. Maybe uh, do something nice. All right, that's all good. But that's not a matter of I have to. Because think about it the other way. What if my wife then says, well, I'm not going to do anything nice to him until he does. Da, 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 da. Suddenly you're, you're getting this really bitter game of, of back and forth. I shouldn't require anyone to do anything for me for me to forgive them. In fact, as just as a word of advice, forgive people even before they confess that they've done anything wrong. Just, just go live in forgiveness. Don't carry anger and pain around with you. Go forgive people. But on the other hand, if I know that I've done someone wrong, I should try to do things that are good to them. I should be trying to do good for them all the time. But, but if I know that someone is hurt, I should try to calm the hurt feelings. Well, while ideally we should all forgive everyone right away, we are sinful people and sometimes that's harder said than done. So while we, we should try to do good to our neighbor and make up for what we have done, we don't have to. That was the key thing on there. All right? So Christ made up for it all. And that's what we should live in, especially when we get tempted to think we should make other people jump through hoops to impress themselves upon us. Nope, don't need to do that. All right, question four. When the pastor says that we are forgiven, he is speaking God's word. That is true. It is God's word of forgiveness. As evidence of that. Uh, where is this written? Uh, the Lord Jesus breathed on his disciples and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone his sins, they are forgiven. Jesus said that. that, that that's God. That, that's not how I would have planned it. That, that's not... It's not fundamentally my forgiveness. It's the forgiveness that Christ is one. And he gives it to us to give out. It's fundamentally his forgiveness, his word. And this is true when I speak forgiveness. This is true when you forgive each other in your own lives. So, uh, question five. When we confess a specific sin to our pastor, he is to never talk about it. That is True. Uh, as part of my ordination vows, I promised to never divulge, that's never reveal, these sins confessed to me. However, that doesn't mean, oh, uh, Pastor Brown is the giant magical get out of jail free card, so I've done something, my parents will be really upset. I'll go confess to the pastor and then I never speak of it again. Well, I won't speak of it, but if you've done something that really hurts someone else or impacts them, I might tell you, you really should go talk to them. If you, if you uh, stole your parents' car, crashed it off in a ditch, and they have no idea what happened to it, you pro I, I will tell you you are forgiven. But I'm also going to tell you, you might need to let your parents know. Um, and if you're worried that mom and dad might kill you, I might even come along and, and, and try to help calm them down. But I'm not going to, I do not divulge. I might give you moral support in helping talking to someone about it, but I don't divulge. Why? I speak a word of forgiveness. And when God forgives, it is absolved. It's done away with. You still have other people to deal with. But before God, it's done away with. And I'm speaking there for God. So, because it's God's word of forgiveness. Question number six. 
If a person refuses to repent of a sin, the pastor is supposed to tell them that they are not forgiven. That is true. That, that's part of my job. You're supposed to be in forgiveness. You're supposed to be seeing sin and fighting against it in your life. And if you're giving up the fight, I'm going to tell you that that's bad. That's falling back into Satan's kingdom. Don't do that. So, um, question seven. The office of the keys refers to the person who unlocks the church doors. That is false. Here at Trinity, we, uh, we have a, a person, well, we used to have a person, uh, Jack Lochner was our sexton. Um, and uh, the, the office of sexton, he, his job was to make sure the lights were off, open up the doors, turn the lights on, uh, take care of the hymn boards. Uh, since he passed away, we've kind of, we're doing it by a bunch of volunteer and such like that. But the, uh, if the church has someone who takes care of the property and unlocks the doors, that's called a sexton. Uh, some congregations have a board of trustees, and they are entrusted, they are the trustees, who take care of the property. That's one of the ways you can serve in the church later on. There is another office. Um, some churches have a sacristan, which is the person who takes care of the sacristy, which is the room just off the side of the sanctuary where all the stuff for communion is held and all the paraments that go on the altar. Uh, we have a group that does all that stuff. That's, they're called the Altar Guild. And uh, if you want to end up helping out with the Altar Guild, help set up for communion, clean stuff up front, you can definitely volunteer once we're all back together. And, and I'm sure uh, Mrs. Sharper, who runs it, would be glad to have you along. Um, so, but no, the Office of the Keys refers to what I do as a pastor. I... I Forgive and open heaven, I, I handle the excommunication and close folks off until they repent again. <clears throat> Question 8. Any man has a right to be a pastor if he wants to be. That answer is false. Um, one of the things that we get for the office of the ministry is that there are qualifications for it. One of the uh, famous passages on that is 1 Timothy 3, and I'm going to start reading that here. The same is trustworthy. If anyone aspires to the office of overseer, overseers are literally the word bishop, same thing for what I do, I know, same thing. He desires a noble task. Therefore, an overseer must be above reproach, the husband of one wife, sober-minded, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not a drunkard, not violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money, he must manage his own household well, with all dignity keeping his children submissive. For if someone does not know how to manage his own household, how will he care for God's church? He must not be a recent convert, or he may become puffed up with conceit and fall into the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must be well thought of by outsiders, so that he may not fall into disgrace, into the snare of the devil. <clears throat> there are qualifications, there are standards to be met, and... Our pastors have to meet those standards. Um, one of them is, yes, we require pastors to be male. That, that's what the standard that's been set forth in the scripture. Why did God do it that way? Beats the car to me. I can give theories, but this is what God has said and we're going to go with. Um, also, there are certain standards. There are certain skills that someone needs to have if they're going to be a pastor. There are certain moral qualifications. If I'm running around having affairs all the time, I don't get to be a pastor anymore. That, that's just the reality of it. Um, the process for being a pastor is this. If you are a gentleman and a good uh, member in good standing in the church, not excommunicated, and you have a bachelor's degree in something, I uh, had my degree in history and classics, you may apply to one of our two seminaries. And you generally go to school for four years to get a Master's of Divinity. And then upon completing all your stuff and completing all your doctrinal interviews, you are certified. And then you're eligible to be, to be called as a pastor. <coughs> but even then, you don't have a right to be a pastor. Um, while I am eligible to be a pastor, this congregation had to call me. They had to invite me and ask me to be their pastor, at which point I could say yes or no. It's not a matter of right. It's a, it's a gift. 
And this is something I think is very important too. We talk a lot in America about this is my right. It's not generally how we talk in the church. We deal with things as gifts. And the fact that I'm a pastor is a great gift given to me by God. It's not given to a lot of people, but this one's given to me. I'm going to use this as an analogy, I think, to kind of help further explain. I wouldn't say that I had a right to marry Celia, my wife. That, that makes it sound like she's some sort of object that I get to do anything. No, she's a gift that was given to me by God. And so that, that's what sets up that relationship. I, I don't oh, I have my right. No, no, oh, good. That, that. Rights are all about trying to force other people to make them do what you want them to do or to let you do what you want to do irregardless of where they're at. We don't operate that way in the church. We deal with the idea of being of gift, of office. I've been placed into an office, and that's a gift. Likewise, you may be given many gifts. You might be given the gift and office of being a husband or a wife or a parent. Or a These are all gifts. We don't deal with rights. We receive things as gifts from God. And so I have a right, or any man has the right to be a pastor if he wants to be misses the point, because that's self-serving. It's a gift from God. Moreover, there are qualifications. And even once you are a pastor, you can be removed from office. Um, if I fall off the wagon and would be excommunicated, I get to be kicked out of my office as pastor. In fact, if I am removed as pastor, I don't get to be a pastor again. I could be brought back into the, the church as a member, but I, I wouldn't be. So if I end up having affairs, I'm done as a pastor for good. Um, there are three reasons why the congregation can uh, rightfully, properly uh, remove a pastor. The first of those is manifest immorality. If I'm having affairs is the big one. If I, if I steal money from the church, yeah, I'm done. Uh, the second is false doctrine. If I am repeatedly teaching falsely, denying things that are in the scriptures and stuff like that, that go against what we as a, a church believe and teach, they can remove me. Um, and then the third is inability to perform. Uh, if I get hit in the head and am brain damaged and can't do what I'm supposed to do, the congregation doesn't say, oh, well, I guess he's our pastor. We'll just leave him in the corner. No, they can officially remove me from office and let someone else take my place and, and call someone else to uh, be the new pastor. Um, but those are the three reasons. And so, yeah, it's not a matter of right. It's a gift, and it's a gift for a time. So, all right, question nine. Excommunication is when a person is kicked out of the church because they are a bad person. That answer is false. It's not about who they are as a person. We're all bad. We all sin. The question is, are we repenting of our sin and seeking forgiveness? If we are, that's when things are right and proper. But if you don't repent of your sin, you could be so... A lot of times the people I've had that communicate are people that I actually like and enjoy. But they weren't repenting of their sin. And so that's the, the thing. It's not a matter of good, bad, it's are you fighting against your sin? A lot of people say, oh, well, they're just picking up. No, no, no. Are you fighting against your sin? And when you don't fight against your sin, when you don't repent of it, that's when things become problematic. All right, and question 10. If a person has been excommunicated, they can never be in the church again. That is false. The whole point of excommunication is the hope that they would come to their senses, repent, and be welcomed back into the church. Um, this is one of the things to remember. Jesus is not seeking reasons to condemn you. <laughs> Jesus is trying to give you his forgiveness. And if he wake up, he's trying to get you forgiveness. The goal of everything that goes on in the church is to get you forgiveness. Even if we have to tell you for a moment, no, you don't get it. It's so that you would repent and would be able to get it in the long run. So that, that's that movement there. Those were the ten... True or false questions? Um, I 
wonder if this isn't going the greatest because I mean, I, this is my second time through it, so I think it's working. But if I'm going fast, I apologize because I just did this like an hour ago. I'm taking the quiz twice. Have pity on poor me. But I'm not going to ask for so much pity that I don't give you the last section, the four questions, the multiple choice. We're going to have four multiple choice questions, and these are here. Question one. The term absolution refers to A, confessing your sin, B, solving a problem, C, forgiveness. Again, that is, the term absolution refers to A, confessing your sin, B, solving a problem, or C, forgiveness. Two, at church, when we confess our sins, A, we confess all of our sins, even the sins we can't remember anymore. B, we do to show that we are good, humble people. C, we don't really mean anything because we're just reading some words. That is, again, at church when we confess our sins, A, we confess all of our sins, even the sins we can't remember anymore. B, we do so to show that we're good, humble people. C, we don't really mean anything because we're just reading some words. Question three. According to the Office of the Keys, it is the pastor's duty, A, to try to find out all the various ways in which you sin. B, to comfort you with the gospel when you feel the guilt of your sin. C, to tell everyone they're forgiven even if they don't repent. According to the Office of the Keys, it is the pastor's duty, A, to try to find out all the various ways in which you sin. B, to comfort you with the gospel when you feel the guilt of your sin. Or C, to tell everyone they are forgiven even if they don't repent. Question four. When the pastor says that our sin is forgiven, we know that we never need to confess again in our lives. B, it's actually God who is forgiving our sin. The pastor is a servant. C, it tells us that we had better do something nice to make up for our sin. So again, when the pastor says that our sin is forgiven, A, we actually we know that we never need to confess again in our lives. B, is actually God who is forgiving our sin, the pastor is a servant. Or C, it tells us that we had better do something nice to make up for our sin. All right, I have no idea if that was in focus. If not, I apologize. All right, so let's go over this. Question one, the term absolution refers to A, confessing your sin. No, that's confessing. B, solving a problem. No, that's a solution or finding a solution. The correct answer is C, forgiveness. To absolve means to remove away, and that's what forgiveness does. It removes away your sin. Two, at church, when we confess our sins, A is the correct answer. We confess our sin, even the sins we can't remember anymore. For letter B, we do so to show that we are good, humble people. Your confession isn't a brag. In fact, if you're confessing, you're saying, no, I'm not good, I'm not humble, and I need forgiveness. So, yeah, don't, don't boast about how well you confess. That's just dumb. We do dumb things, and I specialize in forgiving dumb things, but don't do it. It's dumb. Or uh, letter C was, we don't really mean anything because we're just reading some words. Pay attention to what you're reading in church. They're good. They're God's words. Words about God, too. Pay attention. All right. Question three. According to the Office of the Keys, it is the pastor's duty, A, to try and find out all the various ways in which you sin. Nope. I am not the morality police. I'm not going to go through your life with a fine-tooth comb. Now, if you have questions about stuff, if you have concerns, I will gladly talk to you about them. I'll gladly search the scriptures with you and try and figure out what is good. But no, I, I, I'm not some moral detective. I'm a forgiver. B, to comfort you with the gospel when you feel the guilt of your sin. That's the correct answer. My job is to proclaim the word of forgiveness. Uh, C was this. Tell everyone they're forgiven even if they don't repent. Well, no, I, I'm supposed to encourage you to repent. I preach, ooh, you remember, both the law and the gospel. you got to have both. All right, and then question four. When the pastor says that our sin is forgiven, A, we know that we never need to confess again in our lives. That's wrong. No, no, no. That's why we start church all the time with confession and absolution. That's why even on the video ones that we're doing now, 
We start off with, I confess my sin, and here people forgive me, and then I forgive, they confess, and I forgive them. We live in confession and absolution. We live in receiving God's forgiveness. B, it's actually God who is forgiving our sin. The pastor is a servant. That is the correct answer. We speak God's words. That's why they work. And then C, it tells us we had better do something nice to make up for our sin. No. That, you're, you're forgiven. Now, if you do something nice, great, but you should be doing something nice anyway. And not just to make up for your sin. And when you don't do things that are nice, you still live in forgiveness. You get the point. It really is about God's forgiveness. So, I, I hope this worked well, uh, especially as it's broken up into two parts now, and that kind of threw me off. Um, if it was more disjointed, I apologize, because I don't really remember what I said in part of the first time. So. Um, for next time, and I'm not sure when I'm going to put this up. I'm, it'll be up by next Wednesday at least, but I might put some of it up earlier. I do want you to look at uh, the Lord's Supper, parts 1 and 2, found on pages 322 to 334 in your catechism, and questions 348 to 330, excuse me, 363. It was the assignment for February 26, 2020 has been a weird year. We are way off schedule. But uh, this is okay. We can we can take care of stuff. Um, please do read it. If you have any questions, text me, call me, send me a message on Facebook. Let me know. And uh, parents, if you have any feedback or question, let me know. Um, we'll do a couple more of these sessions, and then we'll probably be good. And then, if you have anything that you would like me to go talk about, we can do a a. Uh, Hey, pastor, go talk about these things, and I will gladly talk about them. And you can let me know, and we can wrap stuff up. And other than that, hang on in there. The Lord be with you. Have fun at home. Don't, don't kill your siblings. Be kind to your family. Be kind to your parents. Hard on everyone being all stuck together. So, And I mean this. I look forward to getting to see you guys again later on. The Lord be with you. Bye. Do your reading. <laughs> Do your reading.